you see countries like Russia and China strengthening their positions. And they really only have one goal, and that is to challenge us and the Western order that has basically dictated to them and everybody else the rules of the game, internationally speaking, for the past 70 years. Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Angel Research Podcast. My name is Jason Stutman, and as usual, we are here today to discuss the market's hottest stock stories, investment opportunities, and money-making strategies for you, the retail investor. Uh, today, we're specifically going to be talking about opportunities in aerospace and defense. Uh, that market is red hot right now as nations are ramping up spending during a period of uh, high geopolitical uncertainty and instability. And that means uh, a lot of money funding into the sector. And uh, we brought special guest Jason Simpkins with us today to walk us through this topic. And uh, Jason is a specialist in the aerospace and defense uh, industry, specifically as it pertains to investing. Um, Jason is otherwise known as J Money. Uh, that's how much J Jason likes making uh, making money. He actually even has a tattoo with uh, a dollar bill on it. Uh, I don't know if it's appropriate for you to break it out. It's I, a it's it's just the nickname. Oh, it's just a, oh, it doesn't have a dollar bill sign. It no, just it's says, says J Money. Money. So Jason's going to walk us through the uh, you know aerospace and defense market, some t new technologies that are coming around. But first, a really quick disclaimer: nothing that we say here today is personal uh, investment advice. We can give you the tools, the insights, and the strategies that will help you make your next breakout trade, but we can't make these trades for you. Also, please uh, like the video, subscribe and comment, show us some love. Uh, we do this for free. All you gotta do is take two seconds to, you know, just click the like button. It ain't hard. Give us a like, show us some love. Come on, guys. Uh, and with all that said, with all that out of the way, welcome Jason to the show. It is great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing terrific. I'm excited to be here. This is my first podcast experience. It couldn't Couldn't be better. Okay, uh, so look, there's a lot of gurus out there. Uh, some of them worth their uh, worth their weight in gold. Some of them not. Um, a lot of them have different um, different you know areas of focus. But uh, you know we have options guys. We have guys who are into resources. Guys who are into tech. But uh, one thing is for certain is that you have a very unique focus in this uh, in, in this in the investment newsletter space um, as far as what you're focused on, and that is aerospace and defense. I don't know of anybody else who really focuses on that space. Uh, so, you know, it is, uh, it's exciting to have you on here today. And maybe we could start off with you giving us a little bit of background about yourself and then maybe give us the elevator pitch on why investors, uh, retail investors specifically, should be involved in and interested in the aerospace and defense industry right now. Okay. So I've been doing this for about 15 years now. I've been a financial analyst and researcher and, you know, I, I started at 23. Uh, so it's... It's been a journey, uh, and you know, I guess I decided to launch trading services focused on this specific se sector, aerospace and defense, about five years ago. The reason was effectively twofold. There was a short-term investing kind of horizon and a long-term one. The short-term one was Donald Trump winning the presidency, and I felt like that made for a tremendous catalyst for military investing because, you know, the Barack, the Barack Obama basically started kind of cutting defense spending. Around that time, our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were winding down. They weren't necessarily concluded, but they were starting to, to come to a close. Uh, there was a shift in the way that we were preparing our military. The, you know, there was an idea of doing more with less, uh, focusing on, you know, certain more lethal projects, certain, like, you know, very specific, highly concentrated areas of investment rather than just splashing the pot with money, which had been, you know, pretty much the way things had gone for, for a few decades. With <clears throat> the election of uh, a president like Donald Trump, who, you know, was very strong with his America First agenda, very big into projecting American power, uh, it was pretty clear to me that defense contractors and the defense space was going to accelerate, that that defense spending was going to come back up, uh, that it was going to be resurgent, and it was. Uh, now, a lot of people didn't expect that to carry over into the Biden administration. I, I did, uh, even before what we saw with Russia. And the reason for that, and something I always tell people, and this is kind of an important thing when it comes to investing in this sector, you talk about the government money. Military projects 
are bipartisan. There are Boeing plants that make munitions in Washington, in Democratic strongholds across the country. There are factories and plants all over the country. They're in Virginia. You look at the D.C. area here in in Maryland, how many jobs are supported by defense contractors. It, it, the industry itself employs millions of people. And when you build something like an aircraft carrier, it's almost like you have, like with the, with the auto industry, you have a supply train. You have this knock-on effect. It's the same thing. It's, it's an investment. Or it's almost like an infrastructure investment. It's like it's putting people to work. So when you put the money into defense, you're putting it into jobs. You're putting it into something that is very sellable for politicians, which is a strong American military and you know being able to, to secure our country. And basically, really, if you're super idealistic about it, promote democracy overseas. Uh, <clears throat> all of that, the short-term catalyst in terms of why I would get into this space, the long-term catalyst, the more cynical person that I am. Now, I view America and the Western order as a power in decline. I, I see waning influence, okay? And you see countries like Russia and China strengthening their positions, and they really only have one goal and that is to challenge us and the Western order that has basically dictated to them and everybody else the rules of the game, internationally speaking, for the past 70 years. They don't want to play by those rules. So the only thing they can do is keep funding their own military machines, keep putting money into their own offensive and defensive capabilities until the point where they are capable of asserting their own sovereign will on the world. Sure. And breaking out of that Western order. That's the longer term catalyst. And that's what we started to see really this year when you see the aggression, when you see Russia, it had already, I mean, around the time you could look at it, I, I, you know, they first uh, annexed Crimea back in 2014, 2015. Uh, so that, you know, that obviously played into, into the, you know, potential for the industry as well. But now with the full on invasion, and you see with China reabsorbing Hong Kong. And we all kind of know Taiwan is next, right? So it's just a matter of them challenging the order and us, you know, the West, the United States and Europe are going to have to rise to the occasion to defend it. How do you see that whole situation playing out uh, as far as Ukraine goes and then maybe just uh, expanding on that? Like is, you know, you said you think Taiwan's next. Do you think mm -hmm. that that's – do you maybe have a timeline for that happening? Uh, do you think that's a – maybe, you know, is that a certainty? you think it's a likelihood? I think it's an overwhelming certainty. I mean, China has said as much. They have the one China policy. So the one China policy says this is ours. <laughs> I mean, there's there's yeah. no other. It's called the one China policy reason. The the objective is singular. Uh, and so that that's just going to happen. Whether it happens peacefully, whether they're able to reabsorb it through political pressure, uh, which right now Taiwan is obviously not willing to do that. They don't want to be a part. Of, of China. Um, so it seems like the only way they're going to be able to achieve that is through military intervention. And so for them, everything that they do is about basically mitigating or uh, negotiating or negating any kind of U.S. or Western defense of Taiwan. Um, you know, that's, that's the principal goal. It's, and it's, it's not even just Taiwan, too. A lot of times people talk about the South China Sea. They've been very active there. China, like there's this ocean, the South China Sea, it borders about a dozen nations uh, like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam. Now, internationally, every country gets 10 miles off their coast. It's, it's, their, it's their water. That's, that's your coastline. China does not agree with that. <laughs> yeah. they, they think that the South China Sea is called the South China Sea because it belongs to them. And not only is it ripe with resources, even like it's a great fishing area. There's a lot of fish for commercial fishing. There's oil and gas reserves underneath it. It's got resources, but it's also a major shipping channel. It's a lot of, you know, so it, there's a lot of control there. And that, for them, is very much in their kind of sphere of influence. And they, they want that. They want all of that. And they want to be able to say, this is our border. And they again, they want the ability to say what is and what is not 
within their borders. They don't want the United States or Europe or the UN or anybody else telling them what is and or is not China. They're going to tell you. And so that's that's where we're at with it, and that's where we've been. Everything they've done for the past few decades is about achieving this goal, and they're not going to stop until they do it. So, you know, that's that's a certainty. Um, but again, how, how when it happens, to put a timetable on it, I would think sooner rather than later. A lot of people thought it was going to happen at numerous times. A lot of people thought that the pandemic would give them cover, that, that the world was so chaotic and that our military somewhat hobbled because we even had like whole aircraft carriers being basically taken out of commission because the entire crews had come down with COVID. Mm. It was a kind of a wild time. A lot of people also speculated that once Russia invaded Ukraine, well, now here's another great opportunity because the West now is so preoccupied over here trying to fund UK, Ukraine's war and, and resistance to the Russian invasion that they can't necessarily go and divert too much attention and resources to Taiwan, should it be. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know what time exactly, but I, I, it's going to be in our lifetimes, that's for sure. I'll tell you that. Are there any specific <clears throat> options or strategies that we have if China were to just, you know, tomorrow move, move in? On Taiwan, or how do you think that we would actually respond? Is there? Yeah, the way that would play out is probably a lot like it did in Ukraine. It would be a question one of how long can Taiwan hold out with the with the weapons that they have, how long can they withstand? And basically, the Pentagon is going to tell you they've got twenty four hours. Yeah. Um. You know, it's they're just they don't really stand much of a chance in that respect. If they can put up more of a fight, obviously, the better. I mean, you saw it with Ukraine. The, more, the longer you can hold out and, you know, once the countries and the world sees you fighting for yourself and sees that there's a window, they they will act. Um, but that's – I would I would imagine if – especially if China is better prepared than Russia was, which I suspect they would be, I think they're probably inherently better at planning than Russia was. Uh, I think their system of governments, I think they, uh, you know, probably frankly have smarter people in charge. Uh, I think they're a little bit more ready and know what they're doing. But even then, I think Ukraine might have given them a little bit of pause. They might have been like, oh, well, maybe it's not as easy as all yeah. that, you know. Uh, but it, overall, they're not going to have much time. And then you're going to get the same kind of sanctions. You're going to get economic and diplomatic pressure from the Western world. That's probably not going to change their minds. That's going to be something that they're, again, prepared for. They'll look at this whole thing. They'll look at what Russia is doing as more of a trial run, and they'll say, okay, well, they, they were sanctioned in this way. They were cut off from the banking system. They were cut off from SWIFT. Let's be prepared mm-hmm. for that. Let's be prepared. Let's know, you know where, what we got to do, what we've got to have ready, what kind of stockpiles we need, whether it's food or energy resources, technology. Where might we be cut off? Where might our choke points be? Where are our vulnerabilities, uh, economically speaking? Um, and you know, and then, I think China obviously would have way more uh, economic weight to throw around. Uh, you know, I feel like it would be more difficult for us to to levy s- sanctions on them because we rely on them so much. Do yeah. you think that's true? Yeah, China is without question a bigger part of the global economy. Yeah, uh, you know, just just period. I mean, outside of its energy resources, Russia, you know, really has very little to offer. Um, and then you've even seen with with this invasion how willing the world's kind of been to at least for the for the in the short term to stomach higher energy prices or to at least try to pursue them from other sources. Uh, you know, no matter where it is. Uh, so that's. That's that's all. That's kind of like their their one ace in the hole. China has far more than that. I mean, China has, you know, stockpiles of U.S. debt. It has over two trillion dollars of of U.S. debt mm-hmm. that it's holding. It has, you know, basically a, a, a not, not a, a stranglehold, but you know, a, a considerable amount of the world's manufacturing capacity. Like you talk about supply chain issues today. Like sanction China in a wartime effort and see what it, happens. It would get prices. it would get ugly for yeah, sure. Yeah, think of everything that says "Made in China" on it, yeah. and then you know quadruple the price of it. Yeah. Uh, so, I see a lot of this as uh, a lot. Of, I see a lot of what's going on right now is kind of posturing. Um, there's a lot of like chest. People, you know, the, the countries are puffing their chests out. And, uh, you know, one of the ways that, you know, countries do that is, is through spending. And, uh, 
in 2023, the uh, DOD is going to spend $773 billion, uh, which is up 4% from 2022. 4% doesn't sound like that much, but when you have a massive budget, that's uh, that's an additional $30 billion into this already massive industry that you were kind of talking about earlier is really is too big to fail. So maybe you could give us a quick uh, just rundown of maybe three to five key areas in the aerospace and defense industry or technologies, anything specific that you think uh, investors should be looking at right now. All right. First, um, for just for the headline number, it's actually bigger. It's actually $858 billion. That's the figure that came out of the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee earlier this week. Okay. Because that's what, it, like, the, the president makes his budget request, and then this is what actually has happened over, you know, basically the past several years. The Congress comes back and gives them more than what they asked for. Mm. Um, so, actually, the $850 billion that the Pentagon is getting, the Department of Defense is getting this year, is a, a 10% increase. It's $80 billion more wow. than what it was in the fiscal year 2022. So... Now, we're about specific investing, there are so many ways to play. And that's one of the things I, I genuinely love about the space because you look at it and it's it's exciting. It's, it, there's a lot of fun technology. So you, there's basic stuff. One, I, like I, I would always start with the basics. And I mean, these companies are in my portfolio, but I don't mind mentioning them because they're, they're pretty Can I, I'm going to interrupt you for a sec. Yeah. Just speaking of your portfolio, I was looking at it earlier. Um, we're in a period right now, uh, year to date, S&P 500 is down 21%. Uh, and I took your portfolio average. You're up six point seven four percent. So uh, I'm hanging just, in there. Uh, that's I mean that is beyond impressive. <laughs> Normal, on a normal year, it's like eh, you know you compound that over time. It's actually a really good return. But you know it's not something that like we would be super impressed with here. But in this environment, I mean I think that's incredible. So I think that's kind of a testament to you know you you know, knowing what you're talking about with these stocks, but also just being in the right place at the right time. Well, right, and that is an important thing to remember too. It's when you talk about defense stocks, you're talking about government spending that isn't going anywhere, right? So this isn't consumer discretionary spending. You know, I'm reading about, you know, like I was just reading about like the CEO of Target and he's like, we got a problem, uh, you know, because people are cutting back on their spending. Well, that's what's going to happen in a recession. You've got to worry about these things. The reality is, you know, there's there's no rainy day really for defense spending in America. Yeah. Uh, and so that government money is going to come. It's not just going to come from the U.S. government. As you said, it's going to come from other now European countries that are scrambling to up their defense budgets as well in light of, of uh, Russia's invasion. So I recommended Northrop Grumman uh, sometime in – uh, I don't know, earlier this year. Yeah, I think February? it was February. Yeah. February, yeah. That's I think I'm up about like 20 or so percent on that. That was well-timed, but it was also like you could you could kind of see that coming. You could kind of see the storm clouds. And I looked at it as, as much of a safety stock as one with growth potential. It ended up having more growth p- potential given Russia's invasion and the momentum that defense sector picked up after that. But – at first, it was a safety play. I've had Lockheed Martin in the portfolio for years for the same thing, and that's. I think that one's up to. I had to rebuy it when I when I changed uh, services, but like I've I've had I basically been telling people to invest in that since 2017. I know we're up on that. Uh, those stocks are never going to go out of style. Uh, they just won't. And neither will stocks like I always like Raytheon too. Raytheon's not in my portfolio, but like it, I used to own it, and uh, they make a lot of. They make a lot of the missiles uh, that are used in combat, uh, including like Patriot missiles and that kind of stuff. Uh, and and that, like they're like bullets. Missiles yeah. are like bullets. You cannot have enough. Okay, like you're going to war. Like that's the one thing Ukraine has to keep asking for too. It's like we've burned through all these munitions. We need more. Okay, because if the, the the offense weapons from Russia are just going to keep coming. The tank columns just keep coming. Do most of these defense giants do they pay dividends? They do. Okay, that yes, makes they do. That, yeah. that seems like a really safe. That makes it more palatable. One hundred percent. Yeah, you can get like two or three, usually around two or three percent dividends. Yeah, nothing crazy, on. but no, a nice, no, not nice crazy, but it's enough, you know, quarterly. And for a long time, that's more than you were getting out of, you know savings accounts at the bank, it still kind of is. I, I, I feel sure. like uh, savings accounts are still probably about 1% or so. Uh, so if you're getting that from a from a dividend, you're doing okay. Every time I see my interest coming in on my savings account, I just laugh. No, nah, it's going up now with the rate hikes, but, you know, it's still, it's it's not going to be the, the 2 or 3% for, a, I don't know, depending on that, the rate that Jay Powell's going, sure. it, maybe, it, maybe it will be higher, but. Okay, so you, you gave us a specific company. Are there any specific technologies that you're eyeing right now, or? Okay, yeah, m- uh, multiple. 
Uh, first, cybersecurity is always a good one uh, because that's that's another. You talk about like 21st century warfare and weapons. Uh, another one, hypersonics. I've been talking a lot about hypersonic uh, weapons, and it's funny because I've actually been fielding a lot more questions about hypersonic weapons since uh, Top Gun Maverick came out. Because, and I have not seen this movie. It took me a while. Like, Are there hypersonics in that? Yes. Yeah, someone okay. told me he sees he like he like takes a joyride on on like a hypersonic plane mm. in the opening scene. He pops Dark in there. Star. Yes. Yes. Dark Star. Exactly. And he flies off. So I started getting all these questions about hypersonics, which I've been talking about for five years. No one really seemed to care. And then all of a sudden this movie comes out now everyone's got questions sure. about it so well, there's a lot of stuff going on right now too with hypersonics uh, sure. maybe we could focus a little bit on that um so some numbers that i pulled earlier on hypersonics here uh in terms of the increase in spending uh so i had 4.7 billion in 2023 versus 3.8 billion in 2022 right. which represents a 24 percent increase um and you compare that to we kind of talked about the the four to ten percent increase in overall spending so i think it kind of puts things into perspective in terms of like how much the u.s military is prioritizing the growth of this particular technology over the the broader military industry as a whole yeah it's significant. Oh. I can tell you right there too, because you, you nailed the number. Just four point seven billion in the upcoming fiscal twenty three year. In fiscal twenty seventeen, you know what it was? Two hundred and fifty million. Wow. So it's more than a tenfold increase. It's about a fifteen fold increase since yeah. then. Uh, maybe you could give us some information on hypersonic missiles. I know there's a lot of like kind of like I feel like sometimes people overuse the term. What specifically is a hypersonic missile? Who's developing them? Um, Who's leading this race? Uh, should we be concerned about them? Just let's, you know. Yeah. Hypersonic technology has been around uh, for a while, uh, for actually for really about almost 50 years, I think. Uh, it's basically, you know, hypersonic it means you go five times faster than the speed of sound. It means you go multiple times faster than so at the, least Mach 5. the speed of, of, yeah, of okay. speed of sound. Uh, and so that's kind of how fast they go. Now, they, you can do this in any kind of number – of of ways uh in in top gun they had a manned vehicle which is not yeah you can do it and it, it has been done in the past the original uh i guess hypersonic plane i think of the the sr-71 blackbird that was a reconnaissance plane that was manned but now especially when you start getting up to the speeds that you know we're really looking at now you're talking about like Mach 10 even like Mach 20 like these incredibly high rates of speed uh there's really no sense in putting a, a person in that <laughs> it's dangerous and you don't really need them to fly it at that point sure and in, in terms of reconnaissance you, you I don't I don't think you're going to get too much more out of that than you would just with modern satellite technology um but the the big thing is the missiles, right? Okay, so there's it could be there's also different types of missiles. One would be a, a standard kind of cruise missile that shoots in a straight line, right? Uh, a hypersonic missile would just be an incredibly fast missile. Uh, that would that alone is kind of dangerous enough. They can be unloaded from any kind of platform, uh, you know, standard kind of rocket launcher. They can be shot from planes. They can be shot from ships. Uh, that's that's the kind of thing. And to to say like. Who, who has them and who's developing? Basically, Russia and China have them. And Russia just became the first country to use one on the battlefield. They blew up an arms depot in Ukraine with one. Um, I don't know that their hypersonic weapons have performed, I think, to the at, as much as we feared they, they might. I think they've been a little bit... Uh, less consistent than than Russia probably projected, which is typical of them. In terms of what, like their ability to target their accuracy, their accuracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, one th it's one thing to make something go really fast. It's another thing to, to hit your target with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Correct. Uh, again, I, China's probably a lot further along. China's uh, hypersonic weapons pretty much went into service in 2019, uh, and again, the United States doesn't have any in service right now. Uh, so that shows you how far behind we are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, like, the, the big ones they have that kind of tend to really scare people now, you're talking about uh, not the cruise missiles. You're talking about, like, intercontinental ballistic missiles, right? So a standard ICBM, like if Russia or China was going to attempt, like, say, a nuclear attack on the United States, they would shoot a ICBM up in, the, in like, a parabola in an arc. And it would go up out of the atmosphere and it would come down in a relatively predictable trajectory. 
You know, you could kind of see. It would be difficult to stop because even with modern warheads that just do that, they tend to break off into about a half a dozen, a dozen different smaller warheads, so you can't hit them all. And I can tell you that on its best day, the U.S. missile shield, uh, and there's there's numerous ways to there's numerous layers to our missile shield. Most people refer to the triad, which is air, uh, land, and sea power. The sea being seaborne missiles from submarines and Aegis cruisers, uh, land-based missiles, the big ones that come up out of the silos, uh, and then bombers, which are kind of a proactive uh, attempt to to neutralize those threats. The missile shield is on its best day about 80% effective, okay? So if Russia or anybody else shot half a dozen nuclear missiles at the United States, in a best case scenario, we'd knock five of them down, but one would still hit, okay? Gotcha. Uh, that's, that's a traditional ICBM. Now, with hypersonic missiles, they do something different. They have what China's developed and what we're kind of working on. It's something called boost glide technology. They shoot out into the atmosphere on this glide vehicle. The warhead releases, and it goes on an unpredictable path, basically. It doesn't just shoot up in a parabola and come back down. It goes up, travels horizontally, more or less, on a kind of an, like an up-and-down kind of crooked pattern, only kind of chaotically, and then it fires directly down onto its intended target. And it, it does this, again, at an extremely high rate of speed. We really don't have the technology to stop that, okay? So that's what's got most, like, defense experts concerned. And it's what's been concerning for the Pentagon and for politicians for, you know, like I said, for the past several years that it became evident this happened. Mm -hmm. Even last year, last year China conducted a test in which they shot a hypersonic missile, or, or I don't know if it was a missile, but a hypersonic vehicle at least, around the world twice. It circled the planet twice and then came back down. And, you know, the U.S. scientists, the Pentagon, they said, we, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how they did it, and we sure as hell don't know how to do it. Okay? And you're talking about two trips around the world and a hypersonic going to Mach 5 that's 3,300 miles per hour. That means those two trips around the planet probably took less than about a half hour. Okay, so you can circle the globe twice in the time it basically takes you to order a pizza. Like that's that's kind of how fast the technology goes. It's it's a three to four minute journey from Beijing to Washington D.C. or from London to to Moscow. So be, because we're so far behind in this, or mm -hmm. you know, presumably, um, I'm assuming that we're kind of just dumping money into this space right now. What are or if any? Uh, are the specific investment opportunities surrounding hypersonic missiles. Right now, there are at least 70 hypersonic programs in development. Wow. Um, and most every major contractor, the big ones, are working on it, principally Lockheed Martin. They are the most advanced uh, you know, hypersonic company in the U.S. They, like, they're pretty much all of our hypersonic technology has been coming out of Lockheed Martin. It comes out of, out of their department. Uh, but uh, Northrop Grumman and Raytheon, they're also collaborating on several projects. So all that's happening. I just recommended a company that builds rocket engines for all of those companies because, you know, that's I think that's the better play. It's a smaller company. It's not as big. And regardless of who's building the end product, whether it's a hypersonic missile or glide vehicle or whatever, they're going to buy this propulsion system. And so... That I think is probably the best way to play it, but you know that you know a close second would probably be a, a company like Lockheed Martin. Okay, um, and do you uh, give this information to your uh, to your readers? Uh, can you maybe maybe this is a good time to actually kind of tell people about like you know your your newsletter service, um, and then like where they could get that that information on, on that particular company and and maybe some other companies that you're recommending. Sure, all those stocks are in right now my Wall Street's proven ground portfolio. Uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and then the the, ro the rocket engine manufacturer. Um, you know, they're all doing pretty well, but that's where one would find them. I'm sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> oh, no, I was just, you know, what, uh, you know, that information is in reports or how? how yeah, I have several reports on that. I've been, yeah, I've been writing reports on that for years. I'll probably write more. I'll probably do a fresh one because it's, it is so kind of timely and because now I am kind of getting these questions. It's also something, you know, I really do have to, 
update because things are kind of moving so fast mm. and developments are coming out. Uh, about four hypersonic tests in the U United States were conducted over the past couple months. There was uh, one in March that failed, one in April that succeeded. Those are part of the HAWC uh, program. That's a hypersonic air breathing weapons concept. Uh, and then there's the Aero program that Lockheed Martin's working on. That's air launch rapid response weapon. And that's, that was tested in May successfully. And there's another test coming up in July. So the advances are, are you know, happening very quickly. We are in this massive race to catch up. People understand the urgency. I even just saw like Congress even demanded to be briefed on this uh, because they're kind of just now learning uh, the size of the gap of and the disconnect. And like I said, when we talk about China and its intentions, they have this window to act right now where they've kind of got one over on us, you know, and they can they can hold us at, you know, a hostage in, in a way uh, because they have a technology that they know we sure. can't defend. Sure. And, you know, it, it, I think it's unlikely that China would bomb the United States. I think what's likely is they would fire a hypersonic weapon at uh, our bases in, like, Guam or our aircraft carrier groups in the Pacific. To sure, anything that's an immediate threat the to Pacific them. the Pacific fleet and the U.S. presence in the Pacific so that they can have their way there. Okay. Um, one more question before we wrap up. Um, are there any adjacent opportunities to uh, to hypersonics? Like, uh, I saw that you had some reports on a, on, on a satellite firm. I was wondering if maybe they do like tracking of the of the hypersonic missiles, and then you had one on uh, kind of laser laser guided weapons, which I know that they've kind of been fielding on some some uh, some boats in terms of like they'll basically they're heating up a missile to yeah. make it explode. Is that so realistic, or what's the in the defense industry? Everything kind of overlaps. Okay, you know, a lot of times your offensive weapons are your defensive weapons as well. Okay, so like. You know, more or less, you're, you're going to use a missile to shoot down an incoming missile, right? You know, sure. or you're going to use, you know, uh, cyber warfare to, to fight cyber warfare. Uh, the laser weapons are, are also common, like, uh, they're called direct energy weapons, directed energy, because a lot sometimes it's laser can be microwave or something like that, where you basically fry the components. And this would be, this would be very helpful against drone swarms. So like you've got this, you know, swarm of drones come at you. If you can shoot like a microwave pulse that fries their circuits, that neutralizes the problem. And, you know, a lot of those things are specifically with respect to China. China's never going to build as many aircraft carriers as the United States has. The United States has something like a dozen or more aircraft carriers. I think China has one or two. They're not going to go and build a bunch. They're not going to try to compete on that front. Sure. What they want to do is build, a, you know, swarms of smaller expendable drones that they can use to take down a $13 billion aircraft carrier yeah, yeah. on a, with, you know, with $100 million What's of technology. What's the company Lucky Palmer? I know it's not publicly traded, but uh, private private company, they're, they're working on drone swarms and things like that. A lot familiar? of people are working on it. Yeah. I mean... Are, do you have any drone companies in your in your portfolio? I have, a, I have a drone company in my secret stock files portfolio. Okay. Um, okay, speaking of... Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up, but what we'll do is we'll leave a link in the description of this video uh, with so that people can get uh, access to your reports. Um, and that has what, like, you know, ticker symbols? Uh, sure. A full explanation of all of, you know, basically the market, uh, the company, uh, its products, its management, everything, everything that, that you could pretty much want to know about it. If there's something in there that you want to know that's not in there, I would say send an email to, to customer service at outsiderclub.com and I will answer your question. Okay, awesome. <laughs> well, well, we, can link, we can link that one as well. Uh, Jason, thanks for coming on. Uh, for everyone else, uh, please comment. Let us know what you uh, want us to cover next. Uh, like and subscribe to the video. And uh, thanks again for coming on the show, Jason. And we'll see everybody next time.